Good afternoon and welcome to today's Me RIT webinar, part of a series created exclusively for RIT alumni as part of the RIT for Life commitment to your continued education. I'm Lydia Palmer, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications in the Division of Development and Alumni Relations, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the presentation tools. RIT's Me RIT webinar series has transitioned to a new webinar provider, and we want to be sure that you understand some of the changes in your webinar window. All participants in today's webinar have joined in mute mode and cannot be heard during the presentation. However, we absolutely encourage participation. To submit your questions at any time, please enter them in the chat box. The chat box can be opened by clicking on the chat tab at the right of the presentation window. We will make every effort to address all your comments and questions throughout the webinar. You are joining today's webinar using broadcast audio. If for any reason you wish to dial in by phone, please dial into the number posted in the chat box and use the access code provided. Live captioning is also being provided during this webinar and you can find the link to access that in the chat box as well. Note that today's webinar will be recorded and made available complete with captions in approximately one week following today's event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And with that, let's get started. Today's webinar is five important ways to improve your company's cybersecurity. Our guest presenter is Jonathan Weissman, senior lecturer in the Department of Computing Security in the Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences. Professor Weissman has taught more than 50 graduate and undergraduate courses, including networking, cybersecurity, cryptography, ethical hacking and pen testing, digital forensics, malware reverse engineering, systems administration programming, web design and scripting, database design, computer organization and architecture, and operating system design. He is the recipient of a total of eight teaching honors and awards since 2014, including the RIT Outstanding Teaching Award, the Golisano College Outstanding Educator Award, and just this year, RIT Distinguished Teacher Recognition Program Honors. In addition to his teaching on campus, he has developed three courses for the edX RITx Cybersecurity MicroMasters Program, which he currently teaches to more than 200,000 students in over 200 countries. Professor Weissman has co-authored and updated two industry-leading textbooks on CompTIA Network Plus certification and serves as technical editor for many industry textbooks. In addition, he is a network and networking and cybersecurity consultant for local businesses and individuals and has been featured on TV news and talk radio and has had speaking engagements throughout the United States as a cybersecurity expert. He has written countless articles and blogs as a networking cybersecurity expert. Professor Weissman received a master's degree in computer science from Brooklyn College and holds 40 industry certifications, including CCNP routing and switching, CCNA security, CompTIA Security Plus, CompTIA Network Plus, CompTIA A Plus, CompTIA Linux Plus, CompTIA Server Plus, EC Council Certified Ethical Hacker, EC Council Computer Hacking Forensic Investigator, and IPv6 Forum Gold Certified Network Engineer. I think we have established that he is able to deliver this webinar. You can join the thousands of Jonathan's followers on LinkedIn and Twitter at his accounts listed in the chat box. Jonathan, we are happy to have you today. Take it away. Thank you, Lydia, for that great introduction. And how is everybody doing today? I'm looking at the chat box right now, just out of curiosity. Can everybody post a message with where you're coming from today? I want to know where you're geographically located. I'm, of course, at RIT right now in Rochester, New York. We got uh, Buffalo, Rochester, New York, Norwalk, Connecticut, South another Africa. Buffalo, India, Fairport. So little local folks here today, Milwaukee, Montreal, Quebec, Portugal. Portugal. That's great. Turkey, Boston, Massachusetts. 
Great to have everybody with us today. I want to make this as interactive as possible. So throughout the presentation, I'm going to be asking you questions, and I'm going to be watching the chat box for your answers, as well as questions from you. As Lydia mentioned, we're going to try to get to every question as possible. If we do not have time, this is only a one-hour webinar, we will be sure to follow up with any unanswered questions after the webinar concludes. So with that said, let's get going. Today, I've got basically seven things to talk about as far as my agenda. I want to talk about protecting your reputation first. I want to talk about how we can minimize the weakest link in any cybersecurity infrastructure that's humans. And then I have five specific tips that I want to go through that you can bring back to your individual companies and organizations that include bug bounty programs, compliance requirements, correlating and communicating, cyber insurance, and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So with that said, away we go. Protecting your reputation is something that I impart to my students from day one. And it's not just from a cybersecurity perspective. When you think about all of the crazy news stories that have gone down the pike over the last few years, whether it's celebrities or politicians, you've had actual careers that were unblemished and untarnished that went away with one small incident. And from a cybersecurity perspective, of course, a reputational damage event can be fatal and far more catastrophic than some people might actually realize. So I want to start off with a quick question. A uh, very famous institute, the Ponemon Institute, came out with the Challenging State of Vulnerability Management 2019 study, hot off the presses. And they came up with a certain percentage. They do, did their due diligence in terms of research. I want you to type into the chat box. I see some of those uh, answers are coming through already. How many organizations are confident that they can avoid a data breach? Lydia chimes in with 0%. <laughs> a couple of the others said zero. So yeah, yeah. there's a few of us that are, are uh, the naysayers here, the pessimists. Interesting numbers. Uh, so far, from what I can see, Wilkins Sanchez, if this was the price is right, you would win because you're the closest without going over. That number is actually 33%. 33% of organizations are confident that they can avoid a data breach, which means you put three heads of organizations in a room, two of them are sure that they are going to be hit with a cybersecurity attack. Now, what's more revealing to that stat to me is the fact that these are self-reported numbers. Yeah, I'm pretty confident that I won't get hit with a cyber attack. My data is safe. Well, in reality, of course, what they think, what these 33% of organizations think, of course, is not reality. So. I want to throw out another question right now. What percent of organizations are 100% guaranteed to be completely protected and not vulnerable to any form of a cyber attack? Put that percentage in right now. There you go. Anybody typing in a number other than zero is lying or wrong. Every organization, as you've seen from all the crazy news headlines over the past few years, every organization is vulnerable. It's a, not a matter of if you're going to get hacked. Of course, it's a matter of when you're going to get hacked. A couple more uh, poll the audience numbers over here. In that same 2019 cost of a data breach report, the global average cost of a data breach has now reached what? Up a certain percent since last year and up a certain percent since 2014. So we got a bunch of question marks here. And then your fourth number, the United States is double that. So take your first number, multiply it by two, add it a little bit, and that's what we've got for the United States average total cost of a data breach. Pause just to allow some people extra time to type. A wide variance of numbers from 250,000 to 3 billion to 1.2 million, 8.9 million. A lot of numbers that could go in either direction, survey says. The global average cost of a data breach is now 
million dollars. If you looked at the preview for this webinar, we actually had the 2018 number up. I believe it was 3.86 million dollars, up 12 percent since the 2014 study. And here in the confines of the United States of America, we are at 8.19 million dollars for the average, which means some of these data breaches could have higher costs related to the cleanup and aftermath than 8.19 million dollars. What are some of your thoughts in terms of these numbers over here? Are you shocked? Is this what you thought was the case? Give me some of your feedback, some of your reaction to these numbers that we're seeing early on here. Rakesh says expected. Michael says not surprised. A couple of my buddies from my edX courses. Steve says way higher than he thought. So some people are surprised. Some people are saying higher. Some people are saying lower. Next question, folks. I'm going to give you three choices. What's the hardest to repair after a data breach? Is it software, hardware, or data? Software, of course, can be reinstalled. Hardware can be replaced. Data, of course, is what we're looking to protect to the most. But if you do your due diligence and backups and you're not vulnerable to ransomware demands, of course, the data aspect can be mitigated. But let me tell you something, folks. There's actually something that's even more obvious in terms of the hardest to repair than data. Type it in. <laughs> what would you say is even, you go, wow, well, look at those answers coming through. Tyler and Rakesh, and have you guys seen this presentation before? Maybe you saw my introductory yeah, slide I think over some, here. <laughs> some of them are your students there, Professor Weiss. You might have heard me before <laughs> say this in the past. It is much harder. Mike, Mike says, I taught them. I taught you guys well. Reputation, as far, as far as the hardest to repair, is even greater of a cost to repair than data itself. And that's what I want to focus on for our first part today. When you think about the typical scenario, breaches, they are discovered well after the attackers have penetrated your system and they're resident and they're sitting and they're lurking and they're collecting information and they're analyzing. Some reports say that attackers are inside your systems completely undetected for up to 200 days. That's a crazy amount of time. Imagine somebody was in your house for 200 days watching you enter your security codes for your alarm, watching you with your usernames and passwords and seeing what keystrokes you put onto your keyboard. 200 days. And generally speaking, when the breaches are disclosed, there are terrible responses that the companies take. We'll talk about some in a few minutes. And there will be a small kickback in sales. People will say, oh, yeah, you hear about the hack? I'm going to hesitate a little bit before I go to that company, before I actually log in, before I actually feel safe and secure with that company itself. But the crazy, the crazy thing to me is that the breach itself does not affect the company's reputation as much as what they do afterwards, the aftermath, how they actually respond, how they portray their efforts going forward, and the quintessential case of what not to do after a data breach was made possible by an organization called, fill in the blank. What organization gave us the best model of how not to respond after a data breach? What organization? see some of these choices. Some great choices. We're going to go with Arpon. Arpon, a great student of mine at RIT. Arpon, you win the prize. In September of 2017, the news that the PII, the personally identifiable information of more than 147 million people was compromised by one of the credit reporting agencies known as Equifax, and their bus score dropped 33 points immediately after the hack was publicized. Their stock market dropped $4 billion within the first week, 
and they spent almost half a million dollars by the end of the year to actually fix up their mess. I love these polls. You guys are great in terms of the participation. 147 million seems like a lot of people, right? Can somebody give me the number and the company or the organization associated with the largest data breach of all time? Can you give me that right over here? I'm looking for two pieces of information. The company, the organization, wow, you guys are Rakesh. You know, you know, are we kind of telling of points over here? I think Rakesh is in the lead. Do we have a leaderboard? Rakesh with the quick fingers. The breach of Yahoo in 2013, which was revealed after the fact a few years later, that they said only compromised one billion people was upgraded to every single Yahoo account of three billion dollars. So you okay, can 147 million to three billion. You know, that's a chump change for, for data that's being breached. But of course, the PII for Equifax is a little bit more sensitive than the three billion data accounts that were breached by Yahoo, not to minimize that by any stretch of the imagination. But let's talk about some of the big mistakes that Equifax made. Number one, they have a website called Equifax.com. That makes a lot of sense. On that website, they have their digital certificate, implementing TLS, transport layer security. But somehow the geniuses there decided to come out with a new domain called EquifaxSecurity2017.com right after the breach to allow customers to see if they were penetrated, if, if their data was actually stolen. Now, since they came up with this quick, one second, make this website and get this domain up and running without any hesitation. They didn't do their due diligence to get the certificates in place. And as a result, all major browsers were flagging this as a phishing site because they had no digital certificate. So imagine this, your data is breached. 147 million Americans have their PII compromised. You're told to go to EquifaxSecurity2017.com and the browsers say, go away from the site. It's going to steal your information. How would you feel? <laughs> that crazy? But wait, there's more. Because on this site, you actually had to enter the last six, six social security numbers from your SSN. So after the warning, after the breach, you have to throw over six SSN digits. And the site was very buggy. So there were reports that when you checked with a desktop or a laptop, you were told, good, clean bill of health. But then when you checked with your phone, same last six SSN digits, oh no, your information has been compromised. So it was very, very buggy. So that was a humongous mistake. Obviously, they didn't have any plan in place. They threw something haphazardly together and they got that up and running and it had poor reflection on how to clean up the actual breach. Darren, the SSN acronym means social security number. It is the uh, unique identifier for all Americans. And there has been some talk actually of making all SSNs public in terms of going away from that model to identify human beings. Uh, that's a story we could follow up on another day. In fact, when I was an undergraduate in college, my college ID was my SSN. I look back with horror at all my exams and all my registration forms. My social security number was plastered all over the place. Crazy to think about. But in terms of Equifax, you see that EquifaxSecurity2017.com website listed at the top, which was Equifax's real site? There was a full stack developer named Nick Sweeting, and he came up with a great idea to come up with a different domain. So he, completely unaffiliated with Equifax, came up with the domain securityequifax2017.com. It was fake, it had nothing to do with Equifax, but he wanted to see, he wanted to do some research in terms of what people did on Equifax security2017.com and the fake post-breach Equifax website actually got 200,000 hits. And here is you know, the absolute jaw-dropping moment of them all. Equifax themselves tweeted a link to the fake site, securityequifax2017.com. In other words, this guy wanted to fake out users to see what their reactions would be. This guy faked out Equifax. And Equifax four times tweeted out a link 
to the fake securityequifax2017.com site. I want to see your reactions. And Tyler's ch chiming in right now. That's awful. That's more than awful. I, I'm looking for a stronger word right now. Um, this is a family show, so I don't know what to say other than that. That is horrendously awful. Completely unacceptable. <laughs> no J on that. Just go. <laughs> Emojis are good as well. <laughs> Adobe, Target, eBay, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Home Depot. What do all these companies have in common? They need to take the edX Mac. I like thing. that. <laughs> I like that, Wilkins. All been breached. They've all been breached. That's a little bit too obvious. I want to ask too obvious of a question. This is a tough question. Just going to pause a couple of seconds. They all had major breaches. And within one year of divulging their breaches, within one year of that date that they divulged their breaches, their share prices were actually higher than they were the year before. In other words, we're talking about reputation and we're talking about the fact that the data breach itself does not correlate directly to the lack of reputation as much as the actual aftermath does. Here are some perfect examples right over here. Okay. Numbers games. Do you know what percent of cyber crimes unleashed were against small businesses? How many of them went out of business within six months, half a year of the breach? And what was the actual key factor? Give me some answers, please. All right, some answers are coming through. Wait five more seconds on the clock. 43% of cyber crimes unleashed against small businesses were unleashed according to the Verizon 2019 data breach investigations report and more than half of them, 60% of small and medium sized companies went out of business within six months of the breach according to the National Cyber Security Alliance. 100% number one answer in terms of why they went out of business was of course the reputational damage. They didn't have the resources, they didn't have the manpower, they didn't have the plans in place like these other major organizations that we saw a second ago, and it was absolutely fatal. When you're talking about a good reputation, at this point we know that it's very valuable, but you know what else? It's very hard to put our fingers on what exactly constitutes a good reputation. People are wishy-washy. You wake up one day and you're angry and you're upset and you wake up the next day and you pretend that nothing happened. Of course, there are analogies that we can apply to day-to-day -to -day life with this. But think about Facebook. Think about all of their incompetent data breaches and the crazy stories that have been coming out of Facebook over the last year or so. And think about all the people who say, oh, that's horrendous. That's horrible. Oh, I got a Facebook message. I got to see who posted one on Facebook. I got to text somebody on Facebook. So it's very hard to actually quantify what makes or breaks an actual reputation, but it goes without saying. The good reputation will bring you more customers. It will bring you more talent, more employees. And the bottom line, of course, is money. People that want to invest in your company, the venture capitalists, anybody who wants to do business with your company, from customer to employee to investor will obviously want to be associated with you if your brand name is there and will want to distance themselves if your brand name is not there. Another survey, the Shreddits 2019 Data Protection Report had some numbers. I'm going to just cut to the chase on these right over here. 33% of the U.S. would start looking for a new job if their employer was breached. 47% of consumers said they would stop and wait to see the company's reaction before taking any next steps. And that's exactly what we were talking about in terms of Equifax. It's not the breach itself, 
but it's how the company handles themselves after the breach. 23% said, we're done. You're dead to me, like Mr. Wonderful says on Shark Tank. 31% would actually tell others about the breach. Some thoughts about these numbers over here? Any comments that you guys want to chime in with in the chat box? I'm watching you. Just going to stall for a little delay. Brianna asks, what's the benefit of telling others about the breach? Well, this is more in terms of consumers saying, oh, hey, you see that big hack over there? I, I know you got an account with them. You sure you want to keep your money in that particular company from now on? Tyler says, I would think they were higher in the past, so not too surprising. Interesting. You know, you know Tyler, you raise a great point. With all the crazy stories that have happened just over the last year or so, we've become so desensitized to these that it just is normal to hear a major data. It used to be, oh, major data breach. Now you hear major data breach. It's like, okay, you know, it's been a couple of days with that one. How do you protect your reputation? You've got to have these plans in place. You've got to have an incident response plan. You've got to have a crisis management plan. You've got to have a breach disclosure plan. They've got to be in place before the actual data breach. So the first number we saw, 33% of companies are confident that they are not confident that they, they're going to be hacked. Uh, actually, 33 said they are. So two, two out of three said they won't be uh, confident. What do you think the percentage of the actual companies had these actual plans? you think Equifax had plans in place like this right over here? I don't think so especially with all the website maneuvering that they did. Yeah. In fact, it's not just important to have a plan. What do you guys think is also important besides having the plan itself? What else do you need besides a plan? Tyler nails it. Practice, practice, practice. I don't know if you guys ever saw the TV show I Love Lucy, one of the most classic TV shows of all time, one of my favorite shows of all time. There was a famous episode where Lucy was pregnant and they were going to take her to the hospital when she had the baby. So Lucy and her husband Ricky and Fred and Ethel went through a couple of practice runs in terms of Lucy saying, okay, the time has come, I'm going to have the baby. And they went through everything very diligently. But when she had the actual baby, when the time was actually there to go to the hospital, the whole plan went awry and there was craziness that ensued. So it's not just having a plan, it's practicing, practicing the plan. Uh, Mike says practice makes permanent, not perfect. Ben says simulate a breach and be ready for attack. Absolutely. In addition to having these, these plans in place, you do need to have media training, not just a little bit, but a lot of it. People who speak in public need to know what to say. You can't have any conflicting reports for your internal communications. They need to be on the same page. You need to have some game plan of how to recover as quickly as possible. And of course, you got to monitor social media to see what people are saying and possibly to respond to what people are saying on actual social media. You need a report from the high level top down of what happened. You need to show the public what you're going to do in the long term, in the medium term, in the short term. People should understand that their data was breached, but now you're taking the proper steps in place. None of these suggestions, of course, were actually carried through by Equifax. You've got to exude confidence. You've got to take responsibility. You've got to say we screwed up. You can't deflect. You've got to show that you're calm. You've got to show that you're responsible. And you've got to show that you're taking full responsibility and ownership to protect your reputation. Any final questions before we move on to the weakest link? Ben says, uh, narrowing the media engagement to specific roles and individuals could help. Oh, absolutely, Ben. Great point. It was a game show, speaking about classic television, not as uh, far back as I Love Lucy, but there was an actual game show called The Weakest Link. Yes. <laughs> and I want to show you some hacks over here. Very famous hacks over the years. You got the United States power grid. You got the Ukraine power grid. It was actually hacked twice. 
JP Morgan Chase, Sony Pictures. These have come up on a couple of our surveys right over here. What do all these hacks have in common? What do all these hacks have in common? Oh, you guys are good, Paul. Nice. I was going to say, if you were stuck, I'll throw John Podesta's email into the mix. And of course, these were all hacks. Oops. These were all hacks that started with something called phishing. Phishing is the digital form of social engineering, making users click on things and download things and run things that they have no business running. So if you take a look at some other numbers, I'm just going to cut to the chase on some of these. Most C-suite executives and small business owners, when you combine these two bullet points, felt the direct cause of breaches was either human error or accidental loss by a human. First bullet refers to external vendors or sources. Second bullet represents internal employees. That translates into the word human. Human, human, human. The 2019 Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report also found that 33% of cyber attacks across all industries, whatever the business, the organization conducts involves phishing. And of course, you know, if there's a well-timed email from a CEO that says, bank transfer has got to take place. I need your signature. I need your approval. Let's get this bank transfer rolling. We're behind schedule. Employees have got to get paid. Spear phishing is when the big uh, targeted individuals are getting these phishing. And of course, there's something known as whaling, which takes spear phishing to the next level where you're actually talking about CEOs and the C-suite executives. Just to be clear, phishing is where you throw out bait and you get somebody to buy it, and that could be just um, random emails. Spear phishing is more targeted. Whaling is where you go after the big enchil enchiladas, the actual CEOs and CSOs. But when you're seeing the spear phishing and the whalings come through, these executives are not only more vulnerable, but they're actually more tied to the data that could bring the company down to its knees and the companies could go down in a quick hurry. So just to be clear, spear phishing, you can think of going to senior executives, but CISOs and other C executive suite employees, that would be the actual whaling. The pecking order of phishing. Another study by Fishme, which became Cofence in 2018, found this is a crazy stat over here. 90, you never see this number in a stat. 97% of phishing emails are designed to deliver ransomware. Have you guys been following the news across the United States cities over the last, let's say, few months? What has been happening to major cities? in states like Florida and Maryland. What has been happening? You got it. Ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. How does ransomware start? Phishing. Who is responsible for phishing? Humans. Who's the weakest link? Humans. See my point? You think about how much money we spend to invest and protect devices like computers and mobile devices that deal with our information. There are tons and tons of examples, multi-factor authentication, endpoint protection, next generation firewalls. We've got all these crazy investments for our devices, but you know what? How much money do we spend comparatively for the human OS, the human operating system? You got to realize that at some point in time, the money you throw into the devices is not going to get you anything more. You're going to get diminishing returns by throwing money into devices. You've got to throw more money to humans. And the way that I like to explain this, can everybody see my hands? These are all the people in your organization, okay? These are all the people that actually read your policies. Somebody want to give me a quick <laughs> definition of a policy? What's a policy? Best definition of a policy, please. 
Here's my definition. Oh, oh my, Glenn, you you guys have all my lines. My gosh, I was going to say a policy is a document that nobody reads. So here are all the people in the organization. Here are all the organiza organizational employees that actually read the policies. Here's the number of people that actually understand the policies. Here are the number of people that actually choose to implement the policies. And then here are all the people that don't fall victim to social engineering attack, whether it's phishing or some other form of social engineering that will lead to something like ransomware. We need to invest more in humans in terms of education. Take my edX courses, corporate training. These webinars are a great example. Constant testing. You can't just teach them. You've got to make sure that they don't click on links. You've got to make sure that they're understanding the training, that they're implementing the training. You've got to take a look at possibly gamifying the actual learning and giving certain rewards. Employee of the month or something like that. Make it a competition. And of course, my last two bullet points here are things that we take out of the employee's hands to sort of do our due diligence to minimize the impact of humans actually being the weakest link. And here we go. Tip, so you might say, well, Professor Weiss, one of those first two things you talked about, the reputation and the humans, uh, how do they differ than the five tips you're about to give us? Well, in my opinion, those two items that we talked about, they're just hardwired and hard-coded musts in every cybersecurity system. Here are some tips which I highly recommend, but it goes without saying, reputations and humans have got to be discussed before we talk about any possible tips. So let's go. Tip number one. You've got major companies like Mozilla, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, Reddit, Square, Intel, Apple, and Microsoft, of course, to name a few, that are using bug bounty programs, which is where you enlist a company like HackerOne, and you get these freelancers, hackers spread across all the world, and you open up your infrastructure, you open up your networks, you open up your systems, and you say, hey, hack me, see what you can find. The quintessential example here, you know, like Equifax was a quintessential example of what not to do during a, an aftermath of a breach, it's the Pentagon. In 2016, Hack the Pentagon debuted. They're still having bug bounty programs in the, in the Pentagon. But if you take a look, it was a highly successful program. And the reason why I think the Pentagon is the quintessential example, it's because when you're talking about the government, when you're talking about the Pentagon, Everything is closed up and restricted and confidential. And in 2016, they had the idea that maybe this whole thing of security through obscurity, which means, oh, yeah, we're safe if nobody could see it or we don't know that they can't see it. That's not really the greatest idea. In fact, it's a horrendous idea. When you open up your infrastructure and you tell people to hack you, your security gets bigger and greater and stronger. It's also much cheaper than hiring people to do the comparable tasks that these bug bounty hunters are going to be doing. And it takes the people that you're paying off of the clock from finding potential vulnerabilities and puts them more in terms of fixing and remediates and, and into, into remediating the vulnerabilities. It allows the collaboration and harnessing of skills from people all around the world to come together. Bug bounty programs are a great example of what you, you and your company can do to secure your infrastructure. Who wants to tell me the big you guys follow my LinkedIn posts? I post about 50 to 100 current events every day on LinkedIn in cybersecurity. So if you're not following me, if you're not connected, now's the time to do it. What articles did I post on Friday? some LinkedIn contacts of mine in this webinar related to this very point. Give me some direct example of what I posted on Friday or what came down the pike on Friday. You got it, Christian. Apple said, you know what? First of all, they were reluctant to open up their infrastructure to bug bounties. Originally, now they've opened it up. Now Apple has expanded their bug bounty program. For instance, a lock screen bypass is 100 grand. User data extraction. 250 grand, kernel code execution, 150 grand, zero click access to high value user asset data, $500,000. And 
Apple now says, if you can come up with a vulnerability related to persistent full chain kernel code execution without user interaction, another game show who wants to be a millionaire, we'll give you a million dollars. Why is Apple doing this? Why are they opening up themselves to higher payouts? In fact, Apple not only is opening themselves up to higher payouts, they're now covering iOS, Mac OS, Watch OS, TV OS, iPad OS, and iCloud. They're saying we'll give you free iPhones that you can do your pen testing on and your, your bug bounty work on. Why is Apple doing it? Because Apple's realizing, just like the Pentagon realized, it's more profitable for people like you to find these vulnerabilities than black hat hackers to actual find, actually find their vulnerabilities. So you take the Pentagon, you take Apple. It makes no sense for a company on a smaller to medium scale not to use a bug bounty program if these exponentially larger organizations are not only using the programs but are using them and leveraging, leveraging them to the actual benefits. The 2019 Hacker Report by HackerOne, one of the lead, leading bug bounty programs along with BugCrowd and Synac, though, shows some, some shocking numbers, really shocking to me when I read this report recently. They said there are not really that many white hat hackers that actually report high value vulnerabilities. Maybe there is not enough of them, or maybe the companies that enlist bug bounty programs like HackerOne are only hearing about the actual low severity bugs. I'm looking at these numbers over here. In 2018, HackerOne reported that 25% of vulnerabilities reported and assigned severity levels are critical to high in severity, which means not that much. This 100% correlates to news from Apple on Friday. Apple saying, come on, let's see what you really got. It's not good enough. It's not big enough. We want bigger. We want stronger. Out of the 300 grand or so hacker one hackers, only 10% of them have actually reported something. And only a quarter of those that reported something got a bounty. So the change to the bug bounty model is actually coming down the pike. In other words, the bug bounty model might not survive the way it is. Maybe after Apple's mandate on Friday, it might do a little bit better. But there are industry practitioners and market research analysts that are saying, look, the bug bounty programs are great, but we might need to evolve to the pen testing model, the penetration testing model. And HackerOne just this year said that it's going to be adding a pen testing model on top of the traditional bug bounty platform because the pen testing model is around $1 billion. But right now, at least the bug bounty program is around $150 million. So you're going to see some change. But that again, that doesn't mean the bug bounty program will die or that it's dying. It's just going to be supplemented by the pen testing model itself. Okay. Tip number two, go beyond compliance. A lot of the times you have companies get these said penetration tests where you have a third party come in and not only find vulnerabilities, but of course exploit the actual vulnerabilities. The pen testing model is more thorough than bug bounty model because you're giving a certain level of information and access and infrastructure to the pen testers. But a lot of times you have this check the box mentality where companies want to be compliant to some of the regulations that I've got listed on the slide right over here. But they don't realize that when they check the boxes to become compliant, that doesn't make them secure. It makes them maybe less likely to experience a breach, but it doesn't make them more secure. You're not going to find the actual critical vulnerabilities with a check the box model. You need a more thorough penetration test. So when you're talking about compliance versus security, when you're non-compliant, that's a big deal. You can lose industry certification and you can even lose the ability to do business. So that's why a lot of companies say, okay, let's bring in a penetration tester. Let's get the report. He's got a few things, he or she has got a few things on this list to check off. We'll check them off. We'll do it. 
and good. We're not going to monitor. We're not going to do any more due diligence in terms of seeing what might be coming down the pike on our network. But meaning compliance does not bring deeper security issues to the surface. When you do a pen test, when you get a pen test done in your organization, you not only have to read the report. I mean, that might seem obvious, but a lot of companies actually don't. Read the report, read the recommendations. You're going to see categories like severe, medium, low, critical. You've got to, of course, prioritize the report. You've got to prioritize what needs to be remediated. And you've got to see those levels of classification. And you've got to take action based on the threats that have some viable threat actor. You've got to take action on the threats that are more immediate than others. Don't jump right away. And you, of course, don't have to address every vulnerability or threat if the risk does not seem to be any form of repeatable or, or actual actionable in the near future, which is not to say ignore for an infinite point of time, but you've got to prioritize because time is of the essence post pen test. Tip number three, correlate and communicate. When you're talking about the putting out fires mentality, you're treating each incident as an isolated one, whether it's Incident one in your company and incident two in your company and incident three in your company. When you're talking about incidents between maybe let's say banks, there was an attack on bank A. Why might bank B have some interest in the attack of bank A? Maybe it's an attack on major banks across the country. You've got to stop thinking, hey, I put out that fire and I'm going to remediate that particular incident. You've got to think in terms of more of the global scale, what that actual attack actually means. Hackers, black hat attackers, attackers, criminals are sharing far more than the good guys are sharing. They're sh sharing techniques. They're sharing um, what's vulnerable. They're sharing systems. They're sharing infrastructures. They're sharing and they're caring. The good guys, of course, are not sharing. And the major concern, of course, is when the good guys share, you could expo expose proprietary information, confidential information, or even embarrassing information. That is, those are the reasons why we're actually hesitant to share. But when you're thinking about, let's say, the private sector sharing with the public sector, who do we go to? If we share with the government, is that going to mean we lose control of our investigations? Is that going to open us up to external criticism? Does that mean now we've got regulations or lawsuits or a crazy reputational harm coming our way? There's no framework. What about reporting to the public sector causing additional regulatory requirements or commitments in time or money? That's why the private doesn't share with the public. Give me one word. Type it in the chat box why the public sector is hesitant to share with the private sector. And the answer, trust is a good answer, Ethan. Bigger answer if this was Family Feud. Number two answer on the board. I'll take that, Mike. That's the answer I was thinking about. Confidentiality. When you're talking about why the public sector doesn't share with the private sector, you're talking about confidential. You're talking about classified information. But think about this. If the adversaries, if the attacks, if the techniques are the same between the public and the private sector, it behooves the public sector to do some form of sharing with the actual public sector. And there needs to be some form of a plan in place to bridge the gap between the public sector and the private sector. Sharing is caring. The cyber threat intel sharing needs to be revamped between the public and the private and the private and the public. What I want to do is I just want to thumb through a couple of these organizations that have been set in place, you might say, hey, there's no infrastructure in place for sharing. There's actually a bunch in place. Take a look. There's an organization known as ISAC, the Information Sharing Analysis Centers. But that only succeeds if CISOs have some form of sharing in place. But you know, of course, that sharing 
is very hard because of sanitization. Wiping out PII, wiping out information that would cause embarrassing or personally identifiable information or compromising information, secret information from coming to light. So you remove specific information, but then that makes the shares possibly worthless. Sometimes you actually have to share meaningful, useful, and helpful information to make it actually meaningful. So CISO should actually share not just what the attacker did, what the attacker attempted, but what did you, the organization, do to respond to the attack? What worked? What didn't? Failure should be shared in addition to actually success stories. Whole point is like a neighborhood watch system. Think about it, like we used the example before, a bunch of banks that are collaborating together so that their overall security, even if they're rival banks, even if they're rival companies, even if they're rival industries, the security needs to be shared at the same level as the hackers are sharing. Okay. So some really quick looks at a few more organizations. You'll take a look at these maybe when you watch the recording, you could Google them. There's CISA, the Cyber Security Information Sharing Act. There is the NCCIC, the National Cyber Security and Communications Integration Center. There is the ISASO, the Information Sharing and Analysis Organization, Standards Organizations. These are mouthfuls, but these are infrastructures that are in place where you can actually do what we're talking about right over here. One more. The IACI, the International Association of Certified, there's a recursive acronym, ISOs. So take a look at some of these organizations that are in place and share and care. Tip number four, cyber insurance, which covers legal settlements, regulatory penalties. They have services that assist in the evaluation, response, and recovery from cyber security incidents. There's a breach response team. They can help you make recommendations. They can give you recommendations for forensic specialists, crisis communicators, legal experts who can help companies get compliant. They can have ransomware uh, fallout plans, digital asset recreation, and they can help you in terms of business interruptions. So to bridge this end of the presentation to the beginning or in tip number four right now, Think about everything that Equifax did wrong and think about if they had some form of cyber insurance that will have these items kick into place when an actual breach occurs. Uh, you can look at these stats offline, but the, I have some best market segment report stats from June 2019 very recently that shows that the cyber insurance market is actually growing. There were $2 billion in premiums in 2018 and 1.1 billion of that 2 billion was actually packaged policies. So what we're not seeing right over here um, is who's implementing it, but what we're seeing is that the market as a whole is starting to pick up some traction. And as you might imagine, the common theme is SMEs, small to medium enterprises, which are often targeted by cyber criminals because they're easier to prey, they would be best served by such either standalone or packaged cybersecurity policies that deal with insurance, insurance, and insurance. Right. Claims grew 39% last year. Again, showing you that this is not just a hollow tip. This is something that's actually picking up traction. Right. You know the Kenny Rogers song, The Gambler, you gotta know when to hold him, know when to fold him. Well, with cyber insurance, it's the same thing. You gotta know when to use your cyber insurance. Part A is having it. Part B is using it. If you're hesitant to use, you know, somebody gets into a crash on the throughway and they tell the driver, oh yeah, I don't want my policy to go up. Oh, yeah, you know, give me this uh, $50 bill and we'll call it even. Cyber insurance shouldn't be treated that way because if you keep the incident on the down low, what happens is you can have greater repercussions down the road again to your reputation. Some companies who have cyber insurance are afraid that the claim will raise their cost of coverage or get their policy canceled. It's the same thing with auto insurance. If you have the insurance, you've got to use it. And here's the kicker. 
Most companies don't even realize that the cyber policy will be triggered when they get attacked or breached. So by not reporting it, they could be found non-compliant. And all of that non-compliant stuff we talked about comes to light, including, of course, but not limited to reputational damage and regulatory penalties. What about a small breach that's not reported turning into a larger breach and spreading for months or even years? And then the stock price, so the share price of the company going down afterwards. Last but not least, AIML. First reason why you've got to be familiar with AIML, artificial intelligence and machine learning, is because, again, the hackers are using it. You can't defend against it unless you know what the hackers are using it for, whether it's finding and exploiting vulnerabilities, prioritizing, creating and modifying malware, automating communication, and scraping the web and other ways of making social engineering more believable. But aside from the fact that knowing what the hackers do is a good reason for AIML, cybersecurity specialists, that's us, we need to detect anomalous behavior in networks. We need to assess levels of risk. And of course, with cybersecurity, the more data that's collected, the better the AIML response will be. This will take out the chances, or at least minimize the chances of false positives and false negatives. When you think about all those articles about how the cybersecurity skills gap is widening and there's not enough people and there are going to be millions of unfilled cybersecurity jobs before long across the entire world, this is a great way to compensate for the lack of humans. Have machines, have robots step into place. When you think about AIML, new attacks can be identified. Statistical inferences can be deducted and endpoints can get the information much quicker than humans. Automation and adaptive networks can dynamically feed this data and take actions without waiting for humans to take actions based on either the lack of humans or the lack of time that individual humans have. Correlation, what we talked about earlier, can be done by AI ML. And a recent study in May 2019 said that 71% of businesses plan to use more of it this year, but 58% don't really know what that means or what AIML actually does. <laughs> so that's maybe a buzz industry marketing term. I would say it's more of a reality than another industry marketing term called blockchain. You throw the word blockchain into the mix or cryptocurrency into the mix. Oh yeah, let's go ahead and do it. And not many people realize what that entails. AIML is more translatable, relatable, and understandable today than some of those other terms that are being bandied around. My final thought, again, is what I impart to all my students. Cybersecurity is high stakes and high pressure, and it's always changing. Of course, the only thing that we said that doesn't change is that humans will always be the weakest link. You have to constantly reinvent yourself. You have to say, hey, what I taught myself, what I learned last month is completely old and obsolete. If you don't want to do that, you're in the wrong industry. If you want to be successful in cybersecurity, you've got to constantly reinvent yourself. The only way to do it, the only way to stay secure and safe is with passion. You've got to have passion and passion and passion on a day in, day out basis. You've got to wake up <laughs> thinking cybersecurity. You've got to eat lunch thinking cybersecurity. And you've got to have dinner thinking cybersecurity. And you've got to go to bed thinking cybersecurity. You've got to wake up in the middle of the night for a glass of water thinking cybersecurity. Thank you so much. Connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter. And I hope to see you there. Thank you very much, Professor Weissman. Um, I know a couple of you do have questions. Give me uh, two minutes. We may have a chance to address them. If not, uh, uh, Professor Weissman will get the chat information out of this, and he can follow up with you specifically afterward. Um, so if you do have additional questions that we don't get to, uh, you can email them to me, rit at rit.edu and we will direct your questions to Jonathan. Note that all participants will receive an email from us in about a week with a link to the uh, recording from today's webinar. Uh, we want to thank Jonathan for sharing his extensive expertise, and we thank you all for joining us um, and taking time out of your day to be with us.
please join us on Thursday, August 22nd for a sort of an out of the box me RIT webinar. Margie Oaks from RIT's Romy Center will join us with a presentation, a value stream mapping case study. Some of you may recall that in May, she invited attendees from the value stream mapping webinar to be present in, uh, to, I'm sorry, to present a real world project for their companies to be worked on over the summer. And on August 22nd, uh, she will be uh, presenting the results of that webinar along with uh, Greg Parley, who is a 2012 RIT alum. Uh, they're going to get together and tell you what they found in doing that, that value stream mapping project. Thank you all again for joining us. When you do exit, uh, you can simply close the live stream window and let us know what you thought through a webinar that will be, or I'm sorry, through a brief survey that you will receive via email. Thank you all so much and have a great day.